All right, we're back from the break. Now let's continue with the story, and we'll see the parallel here. How Esther intervenes with the king, and this shows that if we can draw the parallel with Sidney Powell, she's got to get to the right people to be able to get the information about how this election was subverted internationally. So Mordecai came to Esther and said, you got to get to the king. And she said, well, I can only go if he allows me to come in, raises out the scepter so I can come in. So she said she would fast for three days and prepare. Okay. Then Mordecai went his way, verse 17 of chapter 4, and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Now, came to pass on the third day, this is very interesting, Esther put on the royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's hall. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal hall facing the entrance of the hall. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she received favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the, the golden scepter in his hand, and Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Okay, very formal. Hey, we got to get this right. And the king said to her, What do you desire, Queen Esther? And what is your wish? It will be given to you even to half of the kingdom. Now, she was very clever, so she said, Now, what we need to do, we need to have a banquet. And in this banquet, I only want you and Haman to come. Be a special banquet. Now, this was a trap. So the word went out to Haman that he was invited by the queen, just he alone, with the king, and to have a banquet. So Haman came, you know, and he went to the banquet, and everything was really great. And then the king said, well, Esther, what do you want? She said, well... Tomorrow, you and Haman come together, and we'll have another banquet. And then I will ask you my request. Okay? So Haman went home. He was so delighted. He was really happy. But Mordecai didn't bow down before him. So here, chapter 5, and let's pick it up here in verse 12. And Haman said, Yea, Esther the king, let no other man but me come in with the king to the banquet that she had prepared, and also tomorrow I'm invited to her banquet with the king. Yet, all this fails to satisfy me as long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting in the king's gate and not bowing down to him. So now the intrigue gets a little bit more. So Haman's wife said, verse 14, make a gallows 50 feet high, and tomorrow speak to the king that Mordecai might be hanged on it. Then go in merrily with the king to the banquet, and the thing pleased Haman, and he caused his wooden gallows to be made. Okay? Write down to virtually the last second, okay? Then that night, chapter 6 and verse 1, see, now there's always an instant when something happens that the one who needs to know what's occurring can help out, okay? So here's the king. He couldn't sleep, chapter 6 and verse 1. And on that night, the king could not sleep, and he commanded... 
to bring in the book of the records of the Chronicles, say, bring me the Sunday morning paper, okay? <laughs> and, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had, had told Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers, the guards of the door that sought to lay hands on the king. And the king said, what honor has been done to Mordecai for doing this? And the king's servant said, nothing has been done to him. And the king said, who is in the court? Okay, come right at the right time. And Haman had come in into the other court of the king's palace to speak to the king uh, to hang Mordecai on the gallows which he had prepared for him. Okay, so the king's servant said to him, Behold, Haman stands in the court, and the king said, Let him come in. So Haman come in, and the king said to him, What shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? Well, Haman said, it's got to be me. Okay. And Haman answered, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let the royal clothing be brought, which the king wears, and the horse that the king rides upon, and the royal crown which is set on his head, and let the clothing and the horse be delivered to the hand of the one, the king, most noble princes, so that they may dress the man whom the king delights to honor and bring him on horseback through the streets of the city and proclaim before him, this is what shall be done to the man whom the king delights. Okay, Haman thought, that's going to be me. Well, I wonder if we can draw a parallel. If Trump wins at the last minute, this is going to happen to Biden. Okay? He's going to be disgraced above everything that has ever been in the political history of the United States of America. Okay? So the king said to Haman, Make haste! Take the clothing and the horse as you have said, and do even to Mordecai the Jew who sits in the king's gate, and do not fail to do any of all the things you have spoken. So complete reversal of everything. So Haman had to go out there and say, this is the one that the king delights in. This is the one that the king delights in. I doubt if he said it very loudly, but whatever. Okay. So, then it was revealed that the order that the king signed at the behest of Amon to kill all of the Jews would also kill the queen. So, he reversed the order. He found out about the gallows. And he said, hang Haman on the gallows that he made for Mordecai. Then the order went out that all of the enemies of the king, that is, all the ones that were following Haman against the Jews and against the king, should be executed instead of the Jews. And so in celebration of this, the Jews have what is called the Feast of Purim. Okay? So that's how God intervened there. So will there be anything like that with the election? We don't know. It's possible. Because remember the saying, it's not over till it's over. And I got another little correction on that. I said it was Phil Rizzuto, but it wasn't. It was Yogi Berra who said that. Okay? Now, let's come to 1 Peter. Let's see some things for us as we're living in trepidation 
what's going to happen in America and what's going to happen in the world if Biden gets in. See? Well, if he gets in, it's going to be the most tumultuous times we have ever had. And if he doesn't get in, it's still going to be the most tumultuous times we have ever had. One way or the other, it's going to happen. So how will it go? Okay. So the thing of this, what Peter writes here, you will notice the pattern. He brings out something that's important for us to keep in the forefront of our minds so that when trouble comes, we're not taken down by it. Because sometimes you can have so much trouble come along that you get discouraged, that you don't go to God, that you don't pray, you don't study, and you're overwhelmed, and you feel like Asaph as we started. Why am I going through all of this when the world is out there prospering and I'm having a terrible time even existing? Okay. So the first epistle of Peter, so let's come there, chapter 1. So notice how he starts out and how important this is. See? Lots of times when we're in trouble and difficulty that comes along, it, we need to get our mind on the goal and on what God is doing and on his spirit and on his word. Okay? Now, I'd like to just take right now to emphasize this. Two booklets. What is the Holy Spirit and how to use the Holy Spirit of God? And this is the time we need to do it through use of prayer and study and drawing close to God on how we need to live and survive in the days that are ahead. Because if things turn out for the good, that will be fine. If they turn out for the bad, we'll still have to get along. So we need to understand what we need to be doing. Okay? Right here in the, in the first chapter, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen. Now keep that in mind. God himself has chosen every one of us. Think about that. That's quite a fantastic thing to really keep in mind. God has given you his Holy Spirit. He's involved in your life. Okay? According to the predetermined knowledge of God the Father. And remember John 6, 44, what? The Father draws us, right? And the Father is the great sovereign of the universe. So he's the one who's involved in our lives. He's the one who sent Jesus Christ to be the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. He's the one who has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can look forward to eternal life. And this is what Peter's writing about. Predetermined knowledge of God the Father by sanctification through the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Because when we were conceived, we were begotten. Then we were born, and now we have to be begotten by the Holy Spirit of God, so we can be born again at the resurrection when Christ returns. Okay? Begotten us again unto a living hope. The greatest thing beyond anything we can imagine. Okay? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, reserved in heaven for us. Now, that's quite a thing. See? Now, that's what 
Revelation 21 and 22 are all about. That's the ultimate goal, see. Who are being safeguarded by the power of God through faith. For salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now notice, he covers all of this first so that it will be encouraging and uplifting and helping you draw close to God when he starts talking about the trials you go through. See? So let's read it. In this you greatly rejoice, Though for the present time, if necessary, you are in distress for a little while by various trials. Okay. Now, why do we have trials? And why do we have difficult ones? Well, how's God going to know what you're going to choose? Because he's given free moral agency. Will we always choose God in his way? even when everything may look like it's not going to work out. But just like with Mordecai and Esther and Haman, God can flip it at the last minute. See? So is God in control? Does God raise up nations and put them down? Does God judge nations and people? Does he judge his saints? Yes, he does. So all of this has to do with our relationship with God. See? That you may be in distress with a trial. For what? Verse 7. In order that the proving of your faith now, how important is faith? It's so important that eternal life depends on it, that you love God and believe God and believe his promises, okay? In order that the proving of your faith, which is much more precious than gold, that perishes. Okay, now if you had a big pile of gold here, some said, I'm going to give this to you. You've got to do one thing. And they ask you to break some commandment of God. What would you do? And they'd say, well, we'll offer you a way out. Well, I can't do that. God says, don't do that. Well, you can always repent, can't you? With all kinds of enticements. See? Proving of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is being tested by fire. And everybody's going to have the fire they're going to go through. That is the testing of our faith, see? And so, let hold your place here and let's come to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Okay. Now, we're all going to be tested. That's why we have to be anchored to Christ and the Word of God and have the truth written in our hearts and in our minds so that when these trials come along, we will have the, how shall we say, the spiritual ammunition to fight against it the way that God wants us to fight against us. And by fighting against it, we are building character. And that's what's lacking in the world. And that's what's needed with us because the only way we're going to straighten out the world is if we make it to the first resurrection and God gives us the power to straighten it out. But we have to exercise the faith to get there. So when we have a trial here, here is how it is. Okay? Verse 11, for no one is able to lay any other foundation beside that which has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds upon this foundation gold, that's what Peter referred to, silver, precious stones, 
wood, hair, or stubble. See? Doesn't matter what you're building. It doesn't matter how close your relationship with God is or how far it is. Because there are going to be trials that will come. And with this election, there are going to be some trials that are going to come, especially if Biden gets in there. We're going to see them clamping down on Christians of any kind. We're going to see restriction of publications. We're going to see restriction on, on the Internet and so forth. Those will be coming. See? So what are we going to do? All right. Verse 13. The work of each one shall be manifested, for the day of trial will declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall prove what kind of work each one has. Okay. Now the way you have faith is you work at it, and you build upon it, and you add to it. Okay. Back here to First Peter, the first chapter. Okay. And that you may have praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom not having seen, you love, in whom though at the present time you do not see him, you believe and rejoice with unspeakable joy and filled with, with glory, okay, and receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Okay? Now, because of the trials and difficulties we're going to go through, notice what he says here in verse 13. And this is what we do on Sabbath services. Every Sabbath service where we go through the Word of God, every time we study and pray, this adds to it, see. That's why you've heard it said through the years, prayer and study, prayer and study, because that's the thing that builds the faith that's necessary. Okay? And what does it do? Verse 13. For this reason, be prepared in your minds. Okay? It has all to do with what's there. Be self-controlled. Don't give in to temptations. Don't give in to distress. Don't give in to despair or anxiety. Okay? Be fully hoping in the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform yourselves to the former lust as you did in your ignorance. But according as he who has called you is holy, you yourselves also be holy in all your conduct. So that's what we are to do. See? And that's why we have Sabbath services and study and the things that we have so that we can grow in grace and knowledge and be ready for whatever comes. Okay? Now, let's come over here to chapter 2. Verse 3, if you yourselves have indeed tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as a living stone. See? Now today, there are too many who are lukewarm, and that's a difficult proposition. See? Now, I don't know how you are. I don't know how they are in the other churches of God. I do not know. I've heard different things at different times, but that may come or go depending on what the circumstances are. But I tell you what, when Jesus said, when the Son of Man come, will he find the faith in the earth? The question lies upon each one of us. So we need to ask ourselves, will he find it in me? See? I can't make it be in you. You have to make it be in you. I have to make it be in me through the exercise of God's Spirit with prayer and study, okay? so that we have that faith. Verse 8, to whom coming 
as a living stone rejected indeed by men but chosen by God and precious you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house a holy priesthood that's what we're being prepared for to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ okay so that's quite a thing then he tells us over here he reminds us of the suffering of Christ now there are many places in the Bible where you can read about the sufferings of Christ especially Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and think about this for a minute what Christ had to do to, to divest himself of being God so that he could become a pinpoint of life and be born as an infant and grow up like any other human being, see? That's quite a thing. And you think about that and then ask the question, what is God really required of me that I need to do, all right? We can answer the question this way. You must yield yourself to God in the sense that you give yourself up totally to God. That's the most important thing. Okay. Chapter 2 and verse 21. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Now that's quite a thing to say, isn't it, huh? And do we have the spiritual strength, the spiritual courage, okay, who committed no sin? Now, as impossible as it may seem, I think I mentioned this, but 40%, and i got to bring a sermon on this, of evangelicals believe Jesus sinned. How can you read the Bible and say that Jesus sinned? It's impossible. It says here, Who committed no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When suffering, he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins within his own body on the tree, so that we, being dead to sins, may live under righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. Okay, so that's quite a thing. Think of that. Think of what God has done for us to pave the way and keep that in mind. Do not let any any difficult problem come upon you that you get so discouraged that you just give up. See? Because they will come. Okay? Chapter 4 and verse 12. So Peter writes this. This is very, very interesting, isn't it? How we have all of these things. Think of all the things that talk about the love of God and the grace of God and what we are to do in response to God that way. And then think about that trials are surely going to come. Here's what he says, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial which among you which is taking place to test you. See? All of the trials are a test. Some we can pass better than others. But if you have a weakness and you slip, you go back and repent and ask God to help you put away those weaknesses and temptations. See? That's what it's all about. To test you as if some strange thing were happening to you. 
Now think about it. When those Christians were in Jerusalem, when it was reaching the point of decay and rebellion in 66 and a half AD, the priest heard the voice in the Holy of Holies, let us leave here. So the presence of God was removed. Roman troops were coming. The Jewish people were getting and getting up their armies. And as we saw in the book of Jude, there were those trying to get people to join them to fight against the Romans. But they were fleeing, going on the other side of the Jordan over to Pella, and later then they went on up to Asia Minor up into Ephesus and the different cities up there. But think about that. They had to take up whatever they had, pack it up, put it on whatever animals they had, if they had them, put them on their back, and start walking in faith to get away from the destruction that was coming and having to trust God to protect them and bring them where they would find some safety. Now, none of us have faced that yet, have we? No. So think about it. See? So when we go home after Sabbath services and you get home, thank God for what you have. See? Because that's quite a blessing. And... You might think about if you were confronted with some of those kind of things that would come along where you would have to completely just get up and walk out, what would you do? Well, you have to trust God, okay? Now, verse 13. But to the degree that you have a share of the sufferings of Christ, rejoice so that at the revelation of his glory, you also may rejoice exceedingly. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and the spirit of God is resting upon you. Okay? Think about it. Now, I saw a, a little clip concerning William Tyndale. Now, you, we have a, a very short one about William Tyndale in the front of the Bible, but we have a big thick one that you can order, William Tyndale. But he was betrayed by a friend when he was translating the Old Testament in Antwerp, Belgium, because he exiled himself from England. He had translated the New Testament. He was doing the Old Testament at that time. And Philip was his name, betrayed him, rested by the authorities. He spent a year and a half in prison, but what was he doing in prison? He was translating from the Hebrew, the Old Testament, and he actually finished it. Because it says he finished First and Second Chronicles. Well, in the Hebrew text, the last two books of the Old Testament is First and Second Chronicles. And then his assistant, John Rogers, took that and formed it into what is called the Thomas Matthew Bible. Now I want you to think about T and M, because that was a code for William Tyndale. You take the T and turn the M upside down and put it in front of the T, you've got William Tyndale, W-T. Okay? Now, I have an authentic copy of the William Thomas Bible. Big, thick one at home. Okay? But Tyndale, he was taken out, and they had the pyre all ready to go to burn him. He was given one last chance to recant, and he didn't. 
and he was standing there, and they had the noose around his neck to pull to choke and kill him first and then set the fire afterward. And his last words were this, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Then they pulled the cord, he died, they lit the fire, he was burned up. But God answered that prayer because two years later, the king, okay, he ordered King Henry VIII, he ordered that in every church in England, there was to be placed the English translation of the Bible and that the church would provide a reader for the ones who couldn't read. So think about that. When you think your prayers are not being heard, okay? Verse 14, and if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit and glory of God is resting upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. Okay? Now then, concerning trials and suffering, let's come over here to chapter 5 and we'll finish here. Verse 6. Be humble, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. God will intervene and help. Look what happened to Mordecai. He was ready to be killed, but then was put second in command of the whole empire. Okay. So they may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him, because he cares for you, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is prowling about as a roaring lion seeking anyone he may devour. And he's active whenever there are problems and troubles coming along so that he will try and increase the discouragement and anxiety that the true brethren may have. Okay? Whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are being fulfilled among your brethren who are in the world. Now, may the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, himself perfect you, that's the point of it, and establish you, and strengthen you, and settle you. And God will do it. So he finishes off with verse 11. To him be glory and the power into the ages of eternity. Amen. So when we look and see the trials and difficulties that are taking place, there are many possibilities, but we have to be ready for whatever takes place. And remember, ultimately it is all the will of God. So let's make sure the will of God for us is that we make it into the kingdom of God.